I really appreciate everybody taking time out of their busy days and evenings to join us for our webinar tonight. I think we're going to have some fun. Um, this is the fifth in a series, if you join the entire series uh, from the Catapult Group on uh, curing and composites and adhesives and whatnot, and really kind of this brings us full circle in what we're trying to accomplish, seeing the light, the importance of proper light curing in your office. I, I have a, a ability to be here with you tonight because of help from Densefly Serona, but by no means is this a Densefly-based lecture. This is totally an independent decision-making concept from us at Catapult, and uh, we appreciate their help and support and their ability to offer you a balanced and fair and equitable program. So let's talk about carrying lights. Here they are. They come in all shapes and sizes. They're in our offices every day. As a matter of fact, they've become kind of an indispensable factor in our practices, just like our dental hand pieces are. And yet at the same time, we can easily take them for granted. Good from the dependability standpoint, but bad if we become complacent and fail to take care in how we use them. And once we turn that light on, I think the big question comes up, what's going on? What kind of energy is coming out of there? What's happening with my filling material, my crown I'm bonding on? What is really going on behind the curtain, so to speak, with our curing lights? And that's what we want to explore a little bit tonight as we kind of walk through some of the key concepts that you really want to know about what happens when you turn on the light. So here are our topics in a nutshell. Seeing the light, we want to kind of review the importance of proper curing protocol. Let's understand a little bit more about the concepts like beam profile uniformity, the position of the light source, and how they can play a key role in our clinical success. High output lights, are they still of, of use to us? And short curing times, is that important? How to evaluate your current LED lights in your office? Am I using the best light I can or is it time to shop around for a new light? And then some basic bottom line basics for your selection and use of your LED curing lights in your office. Taking this information and applying it in a practical and positive manner practice, that's really our goal for tonight. So we've got to have a little history because as Yogi Berra, the famous catcher for the New York Yankees would say, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up somewhere else. And so a little history on curing lights I think is, is apropos before we get started. The first light activated system was called Nubafil and it was based in 1970 by the Koch company. And it provided UV radiation used to polymerize a resin-based composite. It was a starting point, but it had very limited depth of cure. It actually had harmful radi UV radiation that was emitted from it, as we found out later on. A loss of intensity over time when you use the light. And there were some possible health issues along with this pioneer in light curing dentistry. Then came along our next generation of lights the broad spectrum halogens and the pack lights. Now, they require a wavelength filter and a heat filter so to suppress unwanted wavelengths like UV, red, and infrared. Both require fans to dissipate the heat. And the interesting thing is very little of the energy necessary to power a halogen light or a pack light is really converted into useful curing energy. So then came along our LEDs. And thank goodness we have these in our practices today because they're becoming more and more powerful and more and more flexible in what they do for us. They replace the halogen and the plasma arcs due to the fact that they just take less energy to deliver the same optical output. The current generation of LED products are very portable and a lot of them have their own uh, batteries within them that are rechargeable, lithium ion or nickel metal hydride, the battery life can vary among these units, and that's one of the things you're going to take into consideration when you look at your curing light or look to buy a new curing light. It's important to consider and evaluate the various entities that are important to successful clinical outcomes before making a purchase. How is this light really going to positively affect my practice? So the curing light market right now is really represented by three segments. The quartz halogen lights that are really shrinking numbers, now representing less than 3% of the market. The laser lights, very expensive, high intensity lights with a single wavelength, usually around 490 nanometers. 
they occupy even a smaller segment of the population. They can range in price from four to five thousand dollars for some of those units. But the bulk of the market are the LED lights, light emitting diodes, 97 percent of the market share. They come in a bunch of different flavors, but really two uh, main differences between the lights that are out on the market today. The monowave LED, which is the vast majority of what's on the market, and then what are called dual wave or polywave LEDs. And those are specific because there are certain uh, photo initiators that are used in some particular products, some particular adhesives, and some particular dental composites that are outside of the range of camphor quinone, which is the CQ that's used in the vast majority of composites. So at some of the lights uh, uh, assist you in getting a better cure by having this dual wave or poly wave option. And then there's just some other LEDs that are out on the market that we really don't know what's in them. Where are they from? Are the LEDs of good quality? What's the output? And those are the ones that we tend to pick up on the internet, over the bargain kind of situations. And we're going to talk about those a little bit later on. So I kind of think of when you're looking for a, a new curing eye, it's kind of like looking for a new car. You've got to consider the features and what you're going to use it for. Does it offer a broad spectrum wavelength to cure all types of, of resins that you're going to use, including all photo initiators outside of the CQ range? Does it have a single or multiple energy mode available to you? In other words, pulse, ramp, that type of thing. Do you even want that? To a degree, it's kind of like a dishwasher. You know, you've got all sorts of cycles on a dishwasher, but most of the time, do you just use the regular wash cycle or maybe the pot scrubber? And rarely do you ever use the china or the fine china or the energy saver, that type of thing. So think about those features, too. How about the diameter of the curing tip? I apologize for that beep, and we should have muted that. My mistake. Hopefully, there won't be too many more of those. What's the diameter of the curing tip? That's an important consideration. We're going to talk about that later on in the presentation. How about the ergonomics of the device itself? Is it a gun? Is it a wand? Is it a pen? The angle of the tip for gaining proper access. Is it well balanced? Does it have good weight to it? And is it the right shape for getting it properly positioned in the patient's mouth? Is the power output stable over the entire charge and use cycle? Or does it vary while you're using it? How would we know that? That's an important thing to think about. The ease of charging and the length of the continuous use of the cycle, how important is that in our decision making? And is the unit infection control friendly? I think a lot of the units nowadays have got sealed buttons and the total surface can be wiped down with any kind of a surface disinfectant. That is a big help to us nowadays. So we don't have little nooks and crannies and areas that are a concern for us with infection control. And how will I evaluate its constant energy output? Will I use a radiometer to monitor this? And is that the right device to be using? And finally, is it manufactured by a reputable company that you trust? I think that's one of the key things to think about as we go forward with the rest of our seminar this evening. Because proper light curing is a lot more than just turning on the light and hoping things work out well. So my mantra to live by when I'm looking at things like a curing light for our office, a composite, a new cement, etc., is I like to take the practicality of what we do in our offices and apply the science that's out there and come up with a technique that I think is solid. Take that solid technique and combine it with the materials and come up with a successful protocol for successful clinical outcomes. That's what we do every day in our practice. So let's look at the science that's out there for a minute. I think this is an amazing piece of information, of data to us. It's a position statement on light curing. And this was formulated a couple of years ago by key researchers, as well as had the support and participation of numerous dental manufacturers. And I think it's an excellent guideline for us in the selection, use, safety, and maintenance of our curing lights. And it was published in numerous journals. This one in the Journal of Adhesive Dentistry, uh, 2014. So this would be, a, a, I think, a huge thing to have as a reference in your office. Another great reference that I like to utilize for curing lights is this 
two-part series from Dentistry Today 2014, Understanding Light Hearings Part 1 and 2. And in this, these two particular pieces, they define what they call the core checklist of variables in light hearing. And what are those core fundamentals? Well, C-O-R-E. C stands for Curing Light Characteristics. The output, the beam profile, collimation. If you're, if you're not familiar with those terms, you're going to get very familiar with them in the next few minutes. Operator technique, placement and orientation of the light tip, an underappreciated phenomenon in dentistry. Where do we put the light tip? Restoration characteristics, the R, location, size, and depth of the prep. How deep is it? How deep is the box? And can I get that operating tip close enough to cure that, that deep of a preparation. And then energy requirements. Not the energy coming out of the light so much is how the energy is accepted by what we're trying to accomplish by exposing it to the light. Meaning the material selection, a light versus a dark composite, a body versus a flowable may have different energy requirements. And the spectral emission to match photo initiators. In other words, do you have one of those proprietary photo initiators that's outside of the CQ range, and does my light cure those properly, or is there something that I might be lacking? So much of what we do with our curing lights today revolve around direct composite resins. And so that's what I want to spend the majority of our time on as we look at how we deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis, because this has really become the bread and butter of our offices as we go down through our daily practices. Truth is reality. In 1990, 94% of the United States dentists chose amalgam as their primary intercoronal posterior restorative material. And yet, let's advance the clock 20 years later and see what happened. Direct posterior composite use has exceeded amalgam by more than two to one. One third of the dentists no longer use amalgam in their practices. And those that do report a steady decline. And in the United States, Dentists currently place 122 million dental composites anterior and posterior per year. And that was 2013, so now it's 2016. I would venture to say that's at least another 10% higher than that. Because dental composites have really become the ubiquitous material for filling anterior and posterior teeth in our patients. Why is that? Well, composites conservative in nature. It has that flexibility to restore only what's missing, which is very key. You can use it as a long-term restorative or as a transitional while you're waiting to maybe potentially do a crown on a patient that can't afford a crown. So you do a large MOD composite instead. We've all done that. And it's the, the less costly of all, the least costly of all the white options for our patients today for tooth restoration. So putting all those together, we can see why composites are so popular in the, in the world today. However, when we're placing those composites, I think we should hold the standards very high for our dental manufacturers. And to their credit, they've risen to that cost. I mean, it should be if we can find a composite that's universal throughout the mouth, that would be awesome. Use it both anterior and posterior. High radio opacity, ease of finish and polish, superior aesthetics, user-friendly handling properties, low shrinkage. And then some other key things that we don't think about too much. Cures with multiple energy sources. LED light, which LED light will my material cure with, or materials within that brand? And is it compatible with multiple bonding systems? In other words, if you like company A's composite, but you like company B's uh, Denton bonding agent or universal bonding agent, will the two be compatible together? And that's research that we need to do first before we start to put products out on the market, or products that are not out on the market in our patients' mouths. The class two preparation dominates the composite scene. Literally half the composites that we place are posterior class twos. So as a result of that, we really need to focus on what happens in those challenging areas when we turn the light on. Posterior composites in general, I think, have a lot of challenges. And you've probably talked about these with in some of the other seminars that you've had, the webinars, as well as you know research that you've done and talking with colleagues and study clubs that Really, I think this is one of the most technique-sensitive things that we do in our practices. There are so many variables involved with posterior composites. 
creating and maintaining an isolated environment. And I'm not talking about rubber dam or no rubber dam or isolite or anything like that. I'm talking about the ability to create and maintain an isolated environment on our prep and how we do that. Proper etching of enamel, proper bond of enamel and dentin, creating a tight interproximal contact in our class twos still can be a challenge for many of us. Matter of fact, 57% responded to a survey a couple of years ago saying that that was still a problem to us in dentistry. The shrinkage and stress on the materials once we turn the light on. What really happens inside that little box we call preparation. Post-op sensitivity. Is that a result of what happens with shrinkage and stress? Are there ways that we can avoid that? And then placing the composite in the preparation. Do we use increments, layers, or can we put it all in bulk? We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit before we finish tonight as well. The effect of bases and liners on success in general, light energy. Mm -hmm. Again, an underappreciated portion of this whole posterior composite challenge is what happens when we turn the light on and how can we have a successful outcome by what we do with that curing light. Finishing and polishing of our posterior composites and many more. They're truly one of the most challenging things we do in dentistry. But let's talk a little bit about what happens when you turn the light on a composite. And there's some, you know, interesting myths and facts out there. So let's touch on a couple of these for a minute. How about composite shrinks toward the light source when cured? Now we heard that for many, many years. And of course, we know that that does not, is not the case. The composite doesn't shrink toward the light. But the Bruce Lewis and Douglas Cross and Sakaguchi uh, research showed us that the direction of the shrinkage, however, is pre predominantly determined by the presence or absence of a bond. This was a great study, and there are many, many other positive things that came out of those studies that they did. How about this one? Incremental placement techniques may be necessary for adequate light penetration, but may result in entrapment of voids, contamination between layers, and increased time required to place the restoration, and does not necessarily reduce shrinkage stresses on the tooth. Well, two different studies found no significant difference between bulk and incremental fill technique when examining marginal gap size. And look at the dates on those studies. 2003, this is over a decade ago, when we were talking about light curing larger increments of composite. How about this one? Contraction stresses, which exceed the adhesive strength of the composite, may result in gaps between the composite and cavity walls. These marginal gaps may lead to microleakage, sensitivity, and secondary caries. And this may be true, but in the literature, there's very little clinical evidence to support that secondary caries are caused by this gap formation when you turn the curing light on and cure a posterior composite. And this one. There is no difference in the extent of polymerization when measured as hardness between bulk fill and incremental fill techniques. Now, this has been shown to be true for lighter shades, and one study found significantly lower micro-hardness values and darker shades. However, this particular study found no difference in micro-hardness in either fill technique, whether it was bulk or incremental fill, as long as the light source was directed through the tooth structure from the buccal and the lingual. Let's think about that for a minute and hold on to that thought. We're going to circle back and look at what happens when we direct the light source from the buckle and the lingual through the tooth structure in a couple of minutes. So does my light really work? When I turn that button on and light comes out of the end and it's bright and I'm shining it on my tooth, is it really curing that composite and how thoroughly is it curing it and how well is it going to make that composite last? One of the ways we've been able to measure that over the years is with these devices that you see on the screen. Demetron Company was the first uh, manufacturer to bring a market-ready radiometer to the dental profession. The one on the left, the white one, was originally designed for halogen lights and should only be used for a halogen light. The one on the right, the blue one, was designed specifically for LED readouts and, again, should only be used for LEDs. So if you have a radiometer in your practice, and I hope that you all do, the fact that it should be geared toward the light that you're using, more than likely today you're using an LED light rather than a halogen, you should definitely be using a LED-based radiometer. Now, what is a radiometer measuring? 
Well, it's measuring the irradiance that's coming out of the energy coming out of the tip. And that's a function of the power, which is measured in milliwatts, times the area of the tip of the light guide. And that gives you the irradiance, or milliwatts per centimeter squared. Now, the, the literature will tell you that curing light should have a minimum of 600 to 1,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared energy output. My preference is I like to have 1,000 milliwatts as kind of a baseline to go from. That's the lights that I like. 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 milliwatts per centimeter squared is the light that I like to use. The most common way to measure this output is with the digital radiometer and with a specific one for the light type that you have, such as LED versus halogen. Some studies have shown, however, that radiometers are unreliable, and yet they remain probably our simplest and really only easy way to monitor our lights on a regular basis to make sure that we're getting sufficient energy output. Now, there can be variations of output within the same light brand initially and over time. In other words, if you have three curing lights, uh, from the same company, the same brand, let's call it XYZ uh, curing light from ABC company, those three lights, when you measure them on a radiometer, even though the company may have calibrated them to give you 1,100 milliwatts per centimeter squared, one may be 1050, one may be 1175, and over time they can actually degrade a little bit as well. So keeping a log of your light output in your offices may be a good idea. Even though LEDs have a very, very long lifespan, they can change or degrade over time. And they get dropped on the floor, accidents happen, etc., etc. That may affect the working of the LED, and you may not know it unless you adequately monitor it. Speaking of monitoring, there are advancements in the radiometer units going on right now, and we may see radiometers of totally different sorts here in the very, very near future. Matter of fact, there are a couple already coming out on the market now that will change the way we look at radiometers. How about energy? Energy required to cure. Now, every brand of composite and every shade of composite within that brand has what's called a signature level of energy to polymerize the resin. Photo initiators such as PPD, VAPO, and TAP have been added to some of the shades, specifically the bleach shades and some adhesives. And the reason that these different photo initiators were added for the bleach shades is because camperquinone, CQ, is inherently yellow in color. And the yellow color can affect the ability for the companies to generate these lighter, brighter, white shades that we want, the bleach XLs, the bleach Ls, that type of thing. So we had to go with different photo initiators in order to reach the goal of creating these whiter, brighter shades. Their curing wavelength is outside of the blue spectrum, which is at 470 nanometer peak. So usually somewhere between 420 and 490 is the blue spectrum. And potentially these will not cure because they, they aren't in that spectrum of wavelength. So the LEDs had to be modified with chipsets that electronically change the, uh, the spectrum of these and to allow it to emit a broader spectrum. And that's where the dual wave or the poly wave lights came. Studies confirm as well opaque shades and darker shades require increased curing time compared to some of the more translucent or lighter shades. So keep that in mind when you're trying to figure out how much energy and how long to cure. Evidence shows some flowables and microfill composites may require additional curing time to properly polymerize. So again, the bottom line when you're looking at the materials, it always be refer to the manufacturer's recommended curing times and output suggestions prior to using all your composites. And you can find that data online. The company should be able to get that to you so that you can make good choices uh, knowing how much energy and how much time you need to cure composites. So again, here's the spectral emission of the CQ range right in here in the middle. And most LEDs right in here will cover that spectrum well. But when you get out here in these proprietary PPDs and the BAPO, uh, photo initiators, we have some issues with that. So consequently, the polywave lights that allow some different uh, wavelengths to be admitted out of the LED came into fashion, and they can cover those PPDs very nicely. How about if you don't cure properly? What are those consequences in proper light curing? Well, you can name them all, and they're all not good. 
inflammatory process with the pulp, lower bond strengths, more water absorption, weaker properties of the materials themselves, microleakage, sensitivity, and of course the dreaded recurrent decay because you don't get a great marginal seal if you don't cure properly. So none of those are good outcomes, and we don't want to have any of those happen if we can avoid that in our practice, especially things that we can control as operators at the chair. One of these things we have to look at with our light itself is the beam profile. And the beam profile is defined as the mapping of the energy transmission at the surface of the tip. The effective part of the beam should be distributed across the face of the light tip to maximize curing effectiveness and minimize the negative impact of operator technique, such as the one over here on the left. It has a uniform uh, coloring, a uniform spreading of the energy versus one here, it's more like a pinpoint, and one here that's almost like a triangle, a little three-legged stool. And the areas in between here, here and here, aren't going to cure very well. And here you're going to get a good cure, a bad cure, a poor cure, no cure. So we have to be worried about that. If you have a small pinpoint light like this, and the beam is a very narrow profile like that, you're going to have a problem where you don't have a broad enough uh, array of the rays getting into the light or in the tooth itself, not enough energy into the tooth. So you're going to have to do overlapping of the curing areas to make sure you get adequate exposure. Another thing we have to worry about or consider is beam collimation. And collimation means the concentration or the how narrow that, that curing energy stays and it doesn't get spread out. I like to kind of look at this as a garden hose. The garden hose on the left side is exactly what we want, a tightly collimated beam of light whereas the one on the right side is more like you've turned the garden hose on the large spray part of the nozzle because you're wanting to water the whole garden at one time. The problem is you get very little water in very little areas of the garden. It's, it takes a long time that way, and with this kind of collimation, you don't know if you're really reaching the deeper, darker depths of your preps without trying to... Uh, with not knowing how the beam is collimated. So that's a very important part for us as well. How about the distance from the tooth? That plays a huge role in what we do. When curing a resin, the irradiance of the light is multiplied by the time of the exposure, and it's reported as joules per square centimeter. So research has shown a millimeter increment of composite requires 6 to 12, 24 joules per centimeter per cubic or per square centimeter to polymerize it. Numerous studies have shown that energy levels available to polymerize that resin will decrease as the tip moves away from the tooth. That makes sense. The further away from the tooth, the less energy is going to reach that preparation and less energy is going to reach the filling material to harden it or polymerize it. And this happens with some lights more rapidly than others. The further away some lights are, the quicker they lose their power. So the use of a curing light with a high irradiance might help, according to some studies, but that doesn't always necessarily play a role in it because if you've got too far of a distance or you don't put the light in the right spot, you have problems. So light performance over a distance can decrease the output, but again, the key is can you get that light guide as close to the tooth structure as you can, possibly even through the tooth structure to get as much light energy into the body of that tooth and that restoration as possible. The position of the light source becomes critical then, and that can vary on a lot of different factors. A few of those are possibly the angle of the light and the tip itself, the size of the tip, orifice, and the diameter. How big is it? 7 millimeters, 8 millimeters, 10 millimeters can cover a bigger area. Which tooth is being restored in the arch? Is it easier to get to an anterior tooth and a distal of a second molar? Absolutely. And if you're not getting the light into the right area of the tooth, you may be missing something there. And, of course, the ability of the patient to open. We've all had patients like that who just can't seem to open their mouth wide enough for us to get back on that second molar. All of these may lead to inadequate curing of the restoration and ultimately a decrease in the longevity, the potential post-op sensitivity the patient may experience, recurrent decay, and a lot of other bad things that we don't want to think about. So when we turn the light on, in a tooth, what's happening? Well, we're creating some stress and shrinkage on that composite, and composite's a volumetric chain within that resin interface. And there's also a complex 
a series of stresses that occur within the bond of the tooth to the or the bond of the composite to the tooth as well. The importance of managing shrinkage stress, you can name them off very easily too. Debonding, microleakage, secondary caries, post-op sensitivity, and possibly even enamel microcracks. So shrinkage facts, polymerization of shrinkage facts. All of these composites, no matter how we do use them, are going to shrink. One, two, three percent, it doesn't really matter. But the key is that when you turn the light on, what happens is the monomer molecules start to form covalent bonds during the polymerization phase. And this, is, this reduces the interatomic distance between them. Now, the inorganic solid fillers, the rocks inside the composites, don't react at all. It's all because the resin that's in the material is starting to react and form these covalent bonds. So what did a lot of manufacturers do to combat some of the shrinkage issues is they just added more fillers, more rocks to the composite. But there's a point of diminishing returns. Once you add so many rocks to a composite, you can't get it out of the syringe. You can't get it into the tooth. It becomes chunky. It becomes thick. You can't work it or, or conform it at all. So as a result, they had to look at modifying the resins to create a better composite for us. Now, the stresses that happen when you turn the light on are very complex because it's an interaction of cavity geometry, reaction kinetics, volumetric shrinkage, the degree of conversion of the composite, and the elastic properties of the material itself. Early and initial stresses within the prep are offset because there's plenty of free monomer around. But as those covalent bonds start to form and they're used up, then the polymer, during the polymerization reaction, the material starts to enter the gel phase. And as it goes to a polymerized state and gets hard, things can happen. Deflection of cuspal walls, a failure of the adhesive bond, a cohesive failure within the adhesive layer, the restorative material itself, or even the tooth are possibilities. This is all because of something called the C-factor. And again, you probably have heard of this, know all about the C-factor, but just to remind you, it's called the configuration factor, and it's really the relation of bonded to unbonded surfaces. So the greater the number of bonded surfaces, the greater are the effects of polymerization shrinkage stress. That's why the, the composites that seem to cause the most problem for us are sometimes not the MOD buckle that you do on Mrs. Smith because she can't afford a crown. It's more that small little occlusal on the 14-year-old high school student uh, on an occlusal of number 13. So that's because of the C factor. Now let's talk a little bit about turning the light on and do I need to layer or do I, can I use a bulk filling concept? This is truly the $64 question and has been for the last 30 years in resin-based composites. And many of those original challenges we've experienced with posterior composite resins have been resolved or at least attenuated. But changing the behavior of us at the chair is very difficult. And yet the science helps bear this out to us. And this was a great uh, kind of a literature review by Mark Patel a couple of years ago in Compendium. To date, the literature has not shown conclusively that incremental layering definitely helps reduce the effects of shrinkage stress versus bulk placement. So again, the literature bears that out. And there's even more support. When you look back at the literature going back 10, 15, even 20, 25 years ago, there's a lot of support for large increment fillings and the fact that layering didn't really play a role or was not a, a negative aspect when they compared it to bulk filling of composites. And then this breakthrough study came out a couple of years ago. This was published in JADA 2011. In this study, they took standardized prep teeth and they compared two different composites, extra fill and Filtex Supreme. Now, extra fill is designed to be a bulk fill material and Filtex Supreme, a classic you know, anterior, posterior, universal composite. They placed some of these samples incrementally and some of them in bulk. Then they cured some of the samples either from the occlusal only or they used through the tooth curing, trans-enamel polymerization. And then they measured the cuspal deflection, which is a measurement of stress using an optical scanning system. And it's interesting, the results that they got. Here's some of them. The effect of the different filling techniques, bulk versus incremental, on cuspal flexure was not significant. Using a bulk fill and through the tooth curing, trans-enamel polymerization, the Filtex Supreme Plus showed 
significantly higher hardness numbers than just conventional bulk fill and the occlusal light only. In other words, the Filtech Supreme Plus, the properties improved in the material when the light was shown through the tooth rather than just from the occlusal. And all the through the tooth trans enamel polymerization samples, regardless of the material, gave superior results for cuspal deflection and hardness. The ability of the light energy to penetrate the enamel walls could be significant. And the bottom line on this is clinicians should be much more concerned about a thorough cure of the restoration than the placement technique. So possibly is placing the light through the tooth structure a benefit to us? And it seems to be based on this study. So when I turn the light on, I've got it in the right placement potentially. Now how long do I want to leave it on for? Well, basically you want to look at a couple of parameters. There's, there's reason to believe that we should increase our curing times for some LEDs and definitely for some of the older halogens if you're still using halogen light. The darker shaded composites bear that out in the literature. Some microfills, some flowables, again, I would check with the manufacturer on those to see if they fall in that category. The further distance you are from the tooth, you may want to increase the curing time. And if you have a poorly collimated light beam, which again, you're going to have to rely on your uh, research on the light that you have to see if that's, uh, you have a good one or a bad one, you definitely may have to increase your curing time. On the flip side, you may be able to decrease the curing time if you're using a plasma arc light, if you've got a lighter shaded composite. Many of the new bulk fill and new bulk fill flowables allow us to cut down on the amount of time that it takes us to cure our materials. If we have close proximity to the tooth and the prep with the light, such as shining the, the uh, light through the tooth structure, that may be helpful to us in potentially decreasing our time for light exposure and good collimation. Bottom line on this is always consult the manufacturer's recommendations. I don't think you could ever go wrong if you do that. So let's fill a tooth. Now this is one of the methods that we use in our practice. I call it the contemporary semi-bulk fill technique. And what we're going to use is we're going to use some of today's technology and uh, kind of some of the science that we know about how we place the curing light and put these two together to come up with a recipe for successful restoration. So we're going to syringe a small amount of a low stress, low strain flowable resin into the proximal box of a class two preparation up to the whole floor or a maximum of four millimeters as recommended by the manufacturer. We're going to light cure through that tooth with sufficient energy, a minimum of 1,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared according to the manufacturer's directions. And then we're going to add a second layer, a little bit of flowable to that prep. We're not going to cure that layer at this stage. And then we're going to put a body composite over the top of that to top cap it. Shape it with some instruments and brushes. Cure it again using through the tooth technology. Remove the matrix, check the occlusion, finish, send the patient out the door. That's how we fill a tooth. So let's walk through it together and step by step. We're going to do the contemporary semi-bulk fill technique with SureFill SDR flow. We're going to bevel all the occlusal margins after we remove the caries with 40 micron diamond. We're going to isolate the tooth preparation with a Paladin Plus ring, a wedge, and matrix of choice. And I'm a big selective etch person. I will selectively etch that enamel first and then follow up with a universal dentin bonding agent according to manufacturer's directions. Air thin that, cure it again according to the directions of the manufacturer. And then here's the newer technology SureFill SDR flow flowable that's allowed to be placed in a bulk increment up to four millimeters in height. Usually that's a, a good, good ratio is up to the height of the pulpal floor. And let that flow into the preparation, cure it through the tooth from the buckle on the lingual, then place a little more flowable on top of that hardened layer, don't cure that little bit of flowable, and then add the body composite, in this particular case TPH Spectra A1, right on top of the preparation, completing and filling the prep. Smooth it with instruments, and then light cure it through the tooth. In this particular case, we're using dual lights, one from the buckle, one from the lingual. It's more efficient, gets more energy into the tooth, and keeps us going at the chair. Removing the band and the ring and the wedge, we start to do some smoothing and polishing with 12 fluted spiral-shaped carbide burrs. Uh, this is another shape of 379 carbide for creating some occlusal anatomy. Finishing and polishing with abrasive cups, points, and discs. 
And there's our finished and final class two using SureFlow SDR flow and TPH spectrum. Simple, straightforward, everyday dentistry for all of us in our practices. So when we go in to pick out a composite and adhesive selection, we have to know that a particular material you're exposing the light to will play a role in the energy need to polymerize and the length of time to expose it. Composites can vary in the amount of uh, energy that they need to polymerize them. So you need to know your composite very well. And this can occur between manufacturers or even within the same product line. Different shades, flowables, body composites, etc. can all have a role. They can all have to be cured a different amount of time with a different energy. And every composite, as we've said before, has its own energy requirements to fulfill its potential. So this data is available, I think, for most major manufacturers of composites. So seek this out. Go on their website or contact your, your local rep to get that data. Another thing you may want to consider to know exactly how your composites and your lights work in your practice is to get what's called a check mark test from Blue Light Analytics. And MARK stands for Managing Accurate Resin Curing. And the check mark test is really fun and easy to do. We did this in our practice this summer, and we checked out 12 different curing lights in our practice, and this is a sample report of what you can get when you do the Blue Light Analytics uh, check mark test. And basically, I'll give you a couple of little rundowns. If you look at this particular light, Smart Light Focus, the stated radiance from the corporation is 1,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Our particular one in our practice measured out on their little radiometer unit, and this is what they measure with. It's a very sophisticated radiometer or energy measuring device. And it measured out at 1179 milliwatts per centimeter squared. That's great. I love that. But then they measure what happens when you're six millimeters away from the tooth preparation with a different jig that they put on to the uh, light sensing device and my irradiance, irradiance dropped to 755 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Well, is that good or bad? Well, let's go down and take a look at the composites that we chose. And we picked a whole boatload of composites that we use in our office and varying shades. And so this, this is really the key. When you look at Filtech Bulk Fill Flow Universal, a four millimeter increment a minimum curing time of 10 seconds and when the is touching the tooth or the preparation and 14.6 seconds if you move further away. But the Filtech Supreme Bulk Flow A1, A2, or A3 shade in a four millimeter increment, which is what's suggested by the corporation, gives you, you need to expose it to 18.7 seconds of curing time when the light is touching the tooth or the preparation and 29.1 seconds. Again, my light, our composite, and our practice. So this would be something that might be interesting to you if you really want to dive into your curing lights is have the check mark test run and go to uh, the website curingresin.com to see how you can get one uh, done in your office. Heat. Let's heat it up a little bit. Is there heat that comes out of these lights? Sure, there's heat that comes out of these lights. Is it clinically relevant, though? And this is where we have to look back at our research and see if this is a problem. Could it cause pulpitis, post-op sensitivity, and even potentially a root canal on a patient? Well, let's see what the research says. Some curing lights have shown the potential to increase resin surface temperatures to up to 80 degrees centigrade at the surface in just a few seconds and pulpal temperatures have been recorded to rise as much as 5.5 degrees within the confines and the pulp of the tooth. So recommendations by the literature, by the research, is saying that we should either pause and wait one to two seconds between 10 second cycles when we're curing our composites, or use cool air from our air water syringe to dissipate any heat buildup that might be happening within the prep. And so that's an easy thing to do, especially the, the, the allowing the, the cool air from your air syringe to go over your tooth. The very interesting thing is there have been no documented pulpal deaths in the literature as a result of light curing. So take that with a grain of salt, too, when you worry about what heat might be building up in the teeth. How about barriers for lights and light guides and covering those light guides? Well, disposable infection can be helpful, and it's a recommended, you know, 
uh, option for OSHA. Uh, there is no standard guidelines, interestingly enough, for the material or thickness of the barrier. Research has shown, though, that some materials used can reduce the irradiance factor by as much as 40 percent. You can lose 40 percent of your energy coming out of the tip, depending on the barrier you're using. So one researcher suggested, and maybe multiples, but one for sure that I've, I've read, uh, a basic food wrap, plastic wrap, saran wrap, can be an easy solution to cover the light tips. And many of us use a lot of saran wrap type things in our practices. Interestingly enough, though, cleaning solutions, if you don't use uh, a barrier, or even if you do and you're wiping things down with cleaning solutions, they can leave a scale or a film on that uh, plastic or uh, glass light guide. So be cognizant of that as well. All right, let's talk about the elephant in the room. This is the budget LED carrying lights. Everybody loves a bargain, right? Everybody loves a bargain. I'm a dentist. We all are dentists, right? We love bargains. We're cheap. I mean, frugal, you know, whatever you want to call it. But lights come in all shapes and sizes and all price ranges from $25 to well in excess of $4,000, maybe even approaching $5,000 for some of the laser lights on the market. Internet sales of the curing lights have caused a flood of these interesting lights into the dental practices. Now, there are currently very few requirements by the ISO, the International Standards Organization for Dental Curing Lights, and most of those standards go back to being limits on UV exposure. So there's really no limits right now for ISO standards regarding intensity, heat generation, or optical damage. So when you're buying one of these lights from a source on the internet, I say caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. And beware of what? Well, beware of things that you don't know. We all cook on barbecue grills and we know, especially on propane or gas grills, there's always the hot spots and the cold spots on your grill. And you can have that just like we talked about with beam profiles, hot spots and cold spots of energy and you just don't know what you're buying sometimes when you get something off the internet. But let's look at the science behind the bargain lights. This was a recent study found to be quite interesting where they compared three LEDs from two major manufacturers with three curing lights purchased over the internet. And the study examined the radiant power, the spectral emission, the beam irradiance profiles, and the ability of the light to sustain output values over a single charge the things that we've talked about tonight and find to be very important when we're selecting a light. Here's what they found. The budget lights showed fluctuating values of irradiance at the tip. No surprise. One budget unit had extremely high output levels at the center of the tip. Could that cause issues with curing, generation of heat? And two budget units were unable to maintain and sustain stable light output levels as the battery charge decreased over time. That's important because when they evaluated the three major, the, the three lights from the major manufacturers, all of those curing lights from those major manufacturers provided even output for at least 100 on-off cycles. That's amazing. That'll definitely take us through more than one day in our offices, right? Let's talk a little bit as we kind of wrap things up here about indirect products. We've spent a lot of time talking about direct composites, which is, again, the bailiwick, the majority of what we do in our practices. But we also use our curing lights for indirect materials, and specifically composite veneers, ceramic veneers, and then all sorts of ceramic and, and non-metal-based crowns in the posterior. The ceramic veneers and, and fully made, you know, uh, composite veneers that are bonded into place, you know, that's not a big deal. But what is a big deal is the fact that the zirconia crowns, they're rising meteorically in our, in our dental field. As a matter of fact, I read one of the major labs is going to stop making PFMs uh, very shortly here. And so the zirconia, I think, is here to stay until the next wave comes through in the next few years. But one study took a look at a specific type of zirconia that was reported to limit the light curing energy and resulted in a lower degree of conversion. So the recommendation of the authors of the studies both said consider dual resin-based cements to ensure a high degree of conversion under this type of restoration. I think that's wise, wise data. Makes common sense, but it, it's worth repeating. So let's get down to the bottom line. Are we seeing the light? Are we seeing the light clearly at this point? I hope so. 
because you got to do your homework whether it's the light that you already own or the light that you're getting ready to, to purchase, you have to make sure you know the key parameters to look for. And have, hopefully after tonight you've got some tips and tidbits that you can take to your office tomorrow and reevaluate where are you in your office with your curing lights. Do I have the best curing lights possible? We depend so much on these curing lights every day for everything we do. Why would we want to skimp on the quality of the light that comes out of those curing lights. Why would we want to buy a bargain basement light that we do not know where the source of the LEDs are from, the source of the electronics within the light? Think about purchasing things from a known entity, from manufacturers you trust, and that have turned out quality products year in and year out, and they will continue to back the product when something possibly doesn't go right with it. And keep in mind the role that we play in successful clinical outcomes with composites in general and where we can place the light and how we use the light. Because I always say it's, it's the archer, not the arrows. We can do a lot of things and goof a lot of things up at the chair. There's so many human errors that can happen with what we do in dentistry. It's amazing we are successful as we are. But keep that in mind when you look at the clinical outcomes. And don't take light curing lightly. Take it seriously. There's a lot more science to this than we've ever thought and we're only going to keep researching this. So at this point, I hope you found what we've talked about at least inspirational, maybe thought-provoking. One of our questions that's a very interesting one, I appreciate it very much, and uh, it is, have you found any benefit in clear matrix bands and rings? And I would have to say unequivoc unequivocally yes. I really believe that uh, the ability to get light energy into our preparation, into our filling material, is paramount in our successful outcomes. And I, I truly believe that getting that light energy in from another source other than just the occlusal is, is key. So clear matrix bands and clear rings, I think, are very beneficial. Uh, and I think more and more manufacturers are starting to see that, and we're going to see more and more of those coming out in the industry very shortly. How do you feel about Velo? Okay, well, I'll answer specific. I don't like to talk specifically about um, you know, each individual unit, but I do have two Velo lights in my practice. I have a corded and a cordless. Uh, I personally prefer portability. Uh, I, I think both lights, both the Velos are great. They're very well-made lights. Uh, they take a licking and keep on ticking. It just depends on if you like to have a cord in your operatory or not. I found the cordless to work very, very nicely. It does give a, uh, a, a user a lot of options as far as different wavelengths. It has a, a plasma arc emulation. It has uh, a high output, a medium output. So it definitely is a very nice light to look at. And if you have that already in your practice, you're using a very good quality light. One of the other questions came up is, how can I cure through the tooth if there's a matrix on the tooth? Well, it depends on where your matrix is positioned. You're absolutely right. If you've got a 360-degree stainless steel Toffelmeyer band around your tooth, you're not going to be able to get the light in anywhere other than the occlusal. But most of the systems today have segmented matrix bands that you can place around the, uh, the interproximal portion, and you put a ring around there and hold that in place. You can cure through the cusp of the tooth. You can also do some initial curing through the cusp and then remove the ring and pull the band back a little bit and cure directly from the buccal and lingual for a little additional curing. You can also cut these bands back a little bit. In other words, sometimes on a premolar, they tend to wrap around the tooth way more than you need. You can cut the little ends off and make it so that it fits a little bit more uh, specifically to the tooth shape that you have. And that gives you plenty of access then to cure through the tooth. Can you really, you can't really over cure. That's another question that comes up. Realistically, what am I getting as far as I can't really, cannot really over cure? I would say that's, that's probably a very true case from the standpoint of uh, Christensen explored that several years ago. Can you ever over cure? I don't think you can overcure unless you overcure with too much heat. If you're overcuring with one of the three-second curing light systems out there, a plasma arc or even a laser, there could be some issues along those lines. But again, the research on that needs to be further going to, to know that for sure. But 
if a, if a person decides to cure instead of 20 seconds, 30 seconds, or 30 seconds, 40 seconds, I think in those increments there's not a problem at all. I certainly wouldn't cure for three or four minutes. I don't think that's necessary at all. Should I rely on the radiometer built into my charger base? That's a great question. I thank you for, for bringing that out because that's a really challenging situation because you don't know how that radiometer was calibrated. And a lot of times when you go ahead and use that light on that radiometer orifice and you turn it on, it's red light, green light. It either is good or it's not good. And sometimes there's a little bit of a yellow, orange, you know, gives you a little bit of stratification depending on the system. But you and I don't know how they calibrated that radiometer. My personal preference is to buy a radiometer that I can rely upon that has a digital readout and at least I can calculate and look at a number and go back and log that in and know that my light was 1,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared, 1125 on this date, 1125 on this date, 1125 on this date, and over and over and repeat that. Simply put, a dual cure or self-cure composite could be an easier way to ensure a cure. Well, absolutely, we have been using you know, self-cure composites and dual-cure composites for a long, long time. Matter of fact, uh, you'll see some of these dual-cure composites coming back in the market on kind of a mixing tip kind of system. Now, a self-cure composite does cut down on polymerization shrinkage and stress issues, but the key there is time. And those materials take several minutes to set up on a self-cure basis. And so the consequence is all we have to sell is our time at the chair. And by using light curing systems, we can speed that up to 30, 40 seconds instead of three or four minutes sometimes, and even longer with some of those systems. <laughs> Somebody wants to know what kind of light I use in my office. Well, you know, we've had the great ability with, to work with a lot of manufacturers over the years and try out a lot of lights. And I can tell you that the manufacturers have worked very, very hard to develop lights that are giving you the quality, energy, the reliability that you need. And uh, the lights that, that we've used in our office have varied over the years. Right now, the current lights that I have, and I think I have 12 or 14 lights that we have purchased because we don't take things for free. We purchase them and use them out and try them out. I've got uh, some caulk lights, some uh, Ivoclar lights, 3M lights, the Velo from uh, Ultradent, those are the four brands of lights that we currently use the most in our practices. That doesn't mean those are the only good ones, uh, but I don't need to purchase any more lights right now. I've also evaluated several other lights from other companies and some lights from some unknown companies. So it's interesting to see how they all play out. Someone's asking specifically how much flowable do I put on that second cure after the initial flowable four millimeters? It's just very little. That initial four millimeters builds up that gingival box area to the height of the pulpal floor. And then once I've cured that, I will put just a little drizzle, just a little drizzle of that excess flowable. And what that's doing is it's acting like a caulking or a gap sealer when I put my body composite on top of it. And that's why we don't cure that second layer of the flowable. You just put that in and the hydraulic pressure of that body composite syringing into the preparation will allow that extra flowable to seal all those little margins. And if you do decide to bevel your margins, we'll seal those beveled margins. That's how we do it. Question comes up about buccal and lingual curing. And when you remove the band and you've got hemorrhage starts to, to kind of come out of the sulcus, is that a problem? Well, I'm not quite so sure, you know, why that would be a problem if, in fact, you've got good hemostasis. And that's where we want to start with any of these things. Proper hemostasis is the way to go before you start any posterior composite because just like taking a crown and bridge preparation, if you don't have good hemostasis and good tissue management, everything else is going to fail. So the chances of having any issues with that, I think, are pretty small. Can I use any part of the flowable? can use any flowable in the box part of the preparation, or is there a particular type of flowable? Well, 
That's an interesting question as well because we've worked with composites for a long, long time. I've been practicing over 32 years and have used a lot of different things. And the technique that we use today, we were using prior to having some of the, uh, the, the low stress, low strain flowables that we have now. That makes life totally predictable now, utilizing those materials. And I think when we get to the point where uh, you can say, yes, you could use other types of flowables in the box, the way I would use that in a class five, or excuse me, a class two situation would be to put a little bit of the flowable down in the base of the box, and I would not cure that increment. When we talk about uh, research that's been done on using regular flowables in the, as a liner in the base of the box, we have to be careful because a lot of times those flowables would shrink more than a traditional body composite would. So the, the way we've used a regular flowable in, the, uh, in a class two box situation would be to place a little bit, maybe less than a millimeter down in the box and not cure it and then hydraulically syringe the body composite into that uh, box area up to the height of the pulpal floor and watch that flowable act like a sealer, act like a gasket, a caulking. And that's how we started doing bulk and semi-bulk fill techniques using a flowable to act like a caulking agent. And it's been very successful. And now with today's contemporary materials that are low-stress, low-strain flowables, we really don't even have to do that anymore. 